All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I am Amy Kuth. I'm a patient educator with the Stephen and Barbara Sloggy Family Cancer Education Center at Mayo Clinic, and I will be moderating this session. This is part three of our five-part cancer and spiritual well-being webinar series. The topic for today's webinar is grief and loss. We want people on this webinar to know that this session is being recorded so that individuals who are not able to join us for this live session can watch it later. For those who would like to view this webinar again, the recording takes about three days to be edited and put on our video library tab on our cancer education page on Mayo Clinic Connect. Mail Clinic Connect is a digital platform where patients, family members, and caregivers can connect, get evidence-based information, and get access to information about classes and webinars that our center offers. We encourage you to follow our cancer education blog on Mail Clinic Connect so that you can stay up to date on our education opportunities. I'll put a link to our cancer education blog in the chat, and I will do that right now. All right, so you should see that link coming through the chat. We will take questions for the webinar today at the end of the session. So if you have questions related to this topic, please type them into the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, so with that, I will now hand it over Today we have with us Alex McQuiga Ganza, who is a chaplain here at Mayo Clinic, and he will be giving the presentation today. And take it away, Alex. Thank you so much, Amy. My name is Evra. My full name is Evra Alexi McQuiza Ganga. I am originally from the Republic of Congo in Central Africa, and I've been in the state for about uh, 12 to 13 years. So today I will be presenting briefly about grief and loss, and it is an honor to share with you the little that I know. So the presentation today, we will explore um, how to become familiar with the stages of grief model. Then we will talk about um, how to explore myth related to grief how to understand cancer related to grief, and finally, the road to healing. So I will start with trying to define what we understand by grief. So first of all, I'd like to share that grief is it's a, it's a personal journey. And it is very different from one person to another. Um, it is a normal process and it is an emotional response that we have to a loss or a loved one. Some people adjust to loss over time. Others take, time, take a long time and others just don't. Um, but also many of us are in this process of grief not even knowing that we are grieving. And sometimes the way we grieve is affected by our belief, religious practices, or even our culture. And we will talk about it later. So I just wanted to briefly um, define what we understand by grief because we hear it, we go through it, and sometimes we don't define it in a way. What are the types of loss? Loss is not just losing a, a loved one, a dear one, a family member, a friend. It's not just losing a person that we know. Loss can be also a physical ability. You are able to play sports. You had an accident. You can't play sport anymore. You are you, you're in a loss because you can use your, the part of your bodies that you used to do. But loss is also meaning and purpose. Let's say you are diagnosed with cancer and all of a sudden you feel like your life doesn't have meaning anymore. You had so much dreams. You had a lot of dreams and goals that you feel like you can't achieve. Your purpose in life 
seems to be lost. So it's not just again losing someone, but we also experience loss when we, we don't see meaning or we actually experience a new type of meaning or purpose. Sometimes we don't see our dreams having to becoming true again, or the goals of our lives are just fading away. Loss is also identity. We sometimes feel like, or I have heard even from the patients that I, I, I chaplain, because I'm a chaplain in the oncology unit um, in an outpatient. And a lot of time I have heard people say, I don't, I feel like I'm losing myself. Sometimes the disease tends to take over your identity. We don't, you don't see yourself as who you are. You only see yourself as having cancer or any other disease. But loss is also losing independence. You are now diagnosed with something and you have lost your autonomy. Someone else is taking care of you. You have so much help and you used to be so independent and now you can't anymore. So those are the different type of loss that we sometimes experience, not just limited to it, there's sometimes more, but those are the biggest one um, that we experience. So those are the different type of loss. I, I, I just want you to know that it's not just when you lose someone that you feel like you're grieving or feel like you've lost, but it's also when you can be using things that you used to do, you have lost your identity, your independence, your dreams, your meaning and purpose. Those are all the loss we experience. What are the types of grief? The first one is the anticipatory grief which usually happens before the loss. And um, not everybody goes through it. It's, it's particular to some. Some people experience it, others don't. I have heard from some of my patients, they were just diagnosed with cancer. And uh, all they could think about was, this is over. I am dying. The person is not dead yet. Or just feeling like this is it. They don't even think that it is possible to experience complete healing, to be healed from the cancer. So their mind goes straight to the grief and they start thinking about all the things that would happen down the road. Or they don't even think that all they're saying is, even though I heal from this cancer for a little bit of time, the cancer will come back. So their mind just goes there already. So they, they're grieving. And if it's a loved one who, who goes through cancer, we already think about what's going to happen. So our mind just goes on a path before we even actually start grieving. And there is a normal and common grief that, ha that happens right after a loss. And again, this is very much different than depression, but it is the most common one we see. And the complicated grief, which sometimes takes longer than usual. It just takes a long period of time and it affects a lot of areas of our lives. So these are the three types of grief that we experience most of the time. So now let's talk about the three stages of grief, different than the types of grief. We have numbness, disorganization, and reorganization. I just want to point out right now that the way we grieve is an the same, like I said earlier, from one person to another. We're all different. We all experience it differently. Some people would start with numbness in their, in their grief uh, process. Then they would go to the disorganization stage and then reorganization. Others may start with reorganization stage of their grief and finish with numbness. 
and others might start with this organization. I'm just trying to say that it's different from one person to another, and we all experience it differently. But today I will start with numbness and follow this path. What is the first stage or stage one of numbness? In this stage, people experience shock. We were just given the news of having cancer and it feels like it's still a dream. It feels like you haven't quite heard well. It feels like you just, in, you do not want to believe that you just heard what you heard. And sometimes you are in denial or we are in denial when we experience that stage. And again, not to say that all those stages happen, all those stages happen, it's some of them do, and sometimes all of them do at once. But we also sometimes try to avoid it. Again, you just received the news of having cancer. And it could be your coping mechanism, trying to avoid a situation and try to busy, busy yourself with something else, just so that you don't think about what you just heard. It is hard. And a lot of time we push people away. People who realize that you are actually going through something serious, you push them away because you don't want to actually sink down that news that you just heard. So we have shock, we have disbelief, we have denial, we have avoidance, and sometimes we push people. And the goal again is to make sure that if it's either you going to grief or a loved one, that you would be able to recognize where you either are or where a loved one is in some of those stages. This, the second stage is disorganization. And it can either happen around you physically or it can happen in your mind where you just can't seem to focus. Yesterday, you were able to play sport. Yesterday, you were able to hang out with your friends. Yesterday, you were able to walk on your garden, blow the snow. And the next day, you happen to be in a hospital. It's, things happen rapidly. It's unpredictable. We have conflicting feelings. And it is difficult to carry on with every day's life. In this stage, things are just, thing, things seem to be chaos and we can seem to focus in our mind and around us. This is the disorganization stage. In stage three, reorganization. In that stage, oddly, we think about people. I have had, I have talked to some family members whose loved one was just diagnosed with, um, with something. And they just couldn't help by think, thinking about someone else. They said all of a sudden, they, they felt the need to reconnect with other people that came in mind. It's quite weird, we don't understand how, why, but in that state, we just try to reconnect with people and relationship seems to matter. We try to re-engage with people that we haven't talked in a while. We want to make sure that they're doing okay. We want to make sure that they are there with us, for us, or that you are there for them. Oddly, again, this is just a stage where relationship matters. And accepting life is just different. So we try to go straight with thinking about someone and you just feel the need to be around or to reach out to someone else. So now that we know what is grief, now that we can define grief, 
now that we know the different type of grief and the different stages of grief, let's try to see how we can walk through grief and loss. The first thing that I have heard being very helpful for most people going through grief is that it feels good to open up. Trying to explore ways in which this grief is affecting you. Attend a group of grief. It's either in a group or it could be one-on-one -on -one with a therapist or simply as reaching out to a good friend or a family member to be able to hold you, to hear you, to be next to you. Share with someone we trust. And it could be anyone, but someone where you feel safe enough to open up. And it can be talking to a clergy. Here at the Mayo Clinic, we have chaplains visiting patients. And we try to see as many patients as we can. But when you get a chance to have a clergy, a chaplain coming to see you and visit with you, Take that chance to open up. Take that chance to process what are the things that are going through your mind. People have said that it has been very helpful just having to process things out loud rather than inside. Because sometimes when we process things inside, it is different than processing with others. You have a chance to heal yourself back. There is a process of healing that happens when you hear yourself talking, when you hear yourself processing, when you hear yourself going through what you're going through. It's there's just something that's there that's somehow magical that tends to bring you relief and healing. So that's the first one that we can do as exploring ways of walking through grief. The second one that I have found very powerful is to let the tears fall. Cry, get those tears out of you. Because if it doesn't happen now, today, it may happen in the most unpredictable and unexpected place and time. Not that you have to force yourself to cry, but when you feel like crying, find a safe place, a safe person, and let it out. Crying provides some type of physical relief. And again, all those different ways, to me, this is, this is the path to healing as we are exploring them but just allow yourself to feel the pain. Allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. And if it comes through tears, let them out as long as you feel safe enough to do so. But don't hold it just because you wanna show that you're strong enough. Cry and let those tears out. I, I always tell myself and always tell my patients that tears have a reason to be. They are there for a reason. And sometimes tears speak louder than our words. Another thing that people have told me has been helpful is to be kind to yourself. And research shows that it is a good thing to do. What do I mean by being kind to yourself? It is good to recognize that what you're going through right now is not a normal, um, it's not an everyday thing. It is something that has happened and interrupted your regular habit of life. So be gentle to yourself because it's a very vulnerable time and practice self-compassion. Putting yourself first, like I said and wrote down, it's not, it's not 
selfishness. It is good to recognize that now it's your time to heal. It's your time to process things. It's not just your time to be there for others all the time. I'm not saying that being there for others is wrong. It's just that you cannot pull on others' cup if yours is not filled. So try to make sure that your cup is full before you pour onto others. And the way in doing this is just taking care of yourself. That's what I mean by putting yourself first. Being okay with how things are unfolding in the moment. Things might be chaotic, like some of the stages of life, uh, of grief. You might be in the stage of disorganization. And things don't seem to be smooth as they used to be. Things seem to be just chaotic. And it is okay to say that this is part of what, what I'm going through right now. And it's okay to let it be. It's okay to say, I will, I will be disorganized for a minute. If this is what I need, I will give myself that. So be okay with how things are coming your way. And again, if you need time to process how things are unfolding, why things are unfolding this way, talk to someone. It is good to bounce ideas with someone and hear some, yourself back or hear some ideas back to you. But be okay because it is okay to let it be the way it is. It is good to acknowledge your feelings as they come. It is good to realize that you are doing your very best. You're not forcing things to be the way they are. You are trying your best to work through it and to get to the end of it. So again, remember you are doing your best and that's very important. No matter what you're doing, it is your best at the moment. Don't let anyone tell you that you could be doing better. You are doing your best. Your loved one is doing his best or her best to go through it. So this, these are the ways of kindness that you can apply to yourself as you, you or a loved one is going through grief. And that's also very, very important. Another way is to share yourself with others as you feel fit or as you find the energy to do so. Some people I have heard um, have told me that when they have experienced grief, they just felt like they needed to go help someone else. It's not necessarily that they are in denial. It's just, it's a sense that they have deep in, the, deep in their gut they feel like participating in something bigger than themselves, themselves. It's just to put your hands in putting a smile in, in another person's face. Just feel like you're being useful or doing something powerful and impactful. So some people have found, have found to be sharing themselves with others by either joining an organization or um, you know, like the picture shows, go do some gardening with others or just go help people in need. Some people have experienced that need as they were going through grief and they have found it to be very helpful. He has helped them heal. By giving, they found healing back to them. So encouraging others going through similar things it's another way of finding healing back. Finding a way to share your talents and your gift is another way of finding healing. Because some have found that it's not helpful to them to just be there and mourn and mourn and mourn. They have mourned for a while. Now they felt like they needed to help someone else mourn or just help someone else. So sharing yourself is another thing that you can explore or that you can help a loved one explore as you see that person being so gifted 
or you know the talent that you recognize in someone or in yourself and again it's always a matter of just trying and see if that helps if it doesn't help well let's explore different ways the biggest one, not so much the biggest, but one of the most important thing and the most common thing that I have found with people experiencing healing is to accept the reality, the new reality. By embracing, embrace the, the present. You're grieving right now. It is not a bad thing. It can be both the good and the bad, just accept them all. Let it come to you, let it, let it be. The fact that you are out of sight of a loved one who has passed doesn't mean that you are forgetting this person. You have lost someone and you're trying to move on to something else. That doesn't mean that this person will be forgotten. A lot of time people trying this out feel like they're experiencing guilt in the same way because they feel like they have moved on either too quickly or they could have stayed in that pain for a while. But if you feel the sense to do something else, go ahead and do it. A loved one would not want you to to suffer. A loved one wouldn't want you to be miserable. A loved one wouldn't want you to cry the rest of your life. Actually, if it's someone who loved you, who has passed, that person would want you to enjoy life for the both of you, for you and for remembering this person. That person would probably want you to move on. But accepting has been a big tool that people have found very helpful. Things may never be the same. Things may look different moving forward. And again, you can choose to accept all the changes. You can, look, you can choose to live with what life looks like. But remember that things may never look the same. But when you accept the fact that things will be different moving forward, some people have found some kind of healing. Acceptance is huge. And again, it's, it's, it's not as easy as saying that I accept and finding acceptance. It's sometimes people that I have talked to anyway like with cancer have told me that they have, they have tried. They have first experienced numbness, shock. They have gone through all those different stages. And they have finally come to a place of saying, you know what? This is gonna be my life. I don't want, I, I'm choosing not to stay there the rest of my life. I'm choosing to make a step forward. But they have, they have, they have expressed all their feelings. They have, they have processed their feelings. They have processed their grief. And now they are in a place where they feel like they can accept it. You can find new meaning in life. You can find new purpose, again, as you find it fit. Some people have been diagnosed with cancer. They, were, they weren't able to do necessarily the same things that they used to do before, but they have adjusted their life. They have found new meaning. They have found new things that they can find purpose in. And they, 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 they went with it. So things are different now, but we tend to just say, you know what? I will give this a shot. I will give this a try and see if I can live with it. And some people, and it has worked for some. I'm not saying that it will work for everybody. But remember, if you feel the need to stay in what, what, whatever of those three stages that I mentioned, stay as long as you need to until you feel like you, it's time to move forward don't rush things don't force things as they come feel it and see what works best 
I have mentioned earlier in the in in earlier in my presentation that sometimes culture of field, cult, cultural belief and religion impact the way we grieve. Some cultural background influence the sh uh, and shape the expression of our grief. It can even provide a sense of structure or routine during the chaotic time. What I mean by that is, um, in your culture, some people may not go through the exact same thing as some of the other culture go through. I will give you an example, and that's my own. In my culture, I'm original from such Central Africa, from the Congo, like I said earlier. And in my culture, we grieve. It's almost like you are recommended, you are mandated to grieve for at least a week. And what we do, we cry for an entire week. You have family members coming to your home. You have you have friends coming to your home and all we do, we sit, we tell stories and we cry. We cry and we cry until we have no more tears to come out. That is my culture. Also in my culture, when we lose someone, the wife who has lost the husband cuts her hair. And that's to show to the community what she's going through. We have ways, and many people in their own culture have ways of experiencing grief in a different ways. We don't all grieve the same way. But what I'm trying to say is your cultural background affect the way you grieve. And sometimes it's just a personal belief. You know, you may say to yourself, I don't feel like, or I don't think that crying for a week is necessary. You may cry for a day and you feel like that's, that's all I've got and that's good enough. That is fine. But I want you to know that sometimes culture impacts us. If you know of someone who's grieving and is from a different culture than yours, be mindful and be sensitive to that cultural background. It's always good to ask what how does the culture inform who that person is and how the grief, how grief and loss is seen in their culture. That person can tell you how they do things and that can actually be helpful for them. It can be either a reminder of who that person comes from and allow this person to grieve just the same way here. But also in some culture, crying is just not acceptable. In some culture, they, they are that they are asked to keep their tears inside. And some people go to grief being completely and entirely silent. But that doesn't mean that they are in denial. They just internalizing things. They are processing their grief in a different way. So culture and personal belief affect all of those different areas in our grief process. And another, another important thing is also it's a religion. Not everybody's religious, obviously. Not everybody's spiritual. But for the people who are religious, religion affects the way we grieve. Some people have found peace knowing that even though a loved one has passed, they are in heaven now and they are comforted by it. They can tell themselves, you know, I have said goodbyes, but I haven't said farewell. That person might still be around me or her spirit might still be close to me. Some people have even experienced a touch on their shoulders once in a while. Some people have seen butterflies and these are all the things that affect the way we grieve and we find hope in it. But also some people in the religious um, aspect of it feel, you know, they believe in the afterlife and they feel like they will, they will see their loved one again. And if it is you that's going through grief and you are religious and your faith has 
a big place in your life. Some people have told me, you know, Alex, I know you, you might feel bad for me, but I am in a good place because my Lord tells me that I'm in a good place. So they find hope, they find healing, and they don't freak out. They don't, they, they, they just accept it. And they are in a good place with the Lord, with their God. Whatever religion, whatever practices they, they, they have. So religion, religion belief also affect how we grieve. But don't be too quick to say of someone that it is in one or another stage because these people might be in that stage but experience it or show it in a different way. They may not cry. They might cry for a whole week. They may not be chatty. They might be silent for a whole week or a month or even years. So all those affect who we are. All those affect how we process things and especially grief. So as you are aware of all those different aspects of what makes a person culturally, personally, and religiously, you know that everybody goes through grief differently. It cannot be the same from one person to another. It can be obviously the same, and I cannot, but it can be the same, but it might look different. And when it looks differently than yours, don't be too quick to assume that the person needs to cry. You can always suggest to bring that person to a safe place to let those tears down. But when that doesn't happen, let it be. So that's why I briefly just wanted to talk about how cultural belief and religious belief affect the way we grieve. So in a summary, what can we say about grief and loss? I think it's very important to know that it is a normal thing. Grieving is totally normal and it is a natural way of reacting to a loss. The social, cultural, and religious, spirituality, whatever you practice, those dynamic influence the, our response to grief. Exploring ways of living with it can be very good, but be aware that the be aware of that presence, be aware of, of that grief, either in your life or in your loved one's life. Healing from loss is possible, but you may never forget the person you've lost, and that is okay. Reality is that some people may never, never heal from their loss. So don't rush people out of their grief, and don't, don't tell them that you've been grieving for way too long. Some people are quick to get out of it. Some people take longer and some may never do. Remembering that that doesn't mean that you are stuck. Remembering the loved one doesn't mean that you're stuck in your past. You know, once in a while, those memories, those stories might come back in mind. But again, don't feel like, gosh, I'm still grieving or even though you have healed from it. Don't feel like you're still there and it is a bad thing. You're not stuck in the past by choosing to move forward. And it doesn't mean that you are betraying your loved one by choosing to make, move forward. Memories and stories are yours to cherish. And you can cherish them as long as you need to or want to. So those are the things I wanted to share briefly about loss and grief. I personally grieve differently than my colleague, than my brothers, than my friends. But also I am mindful that being from Africa, the way that I grieve is different than my friend or my brother here in the US or my you know, different culture do differently. So as you are aware of all those different aspects, that might be helpful in helping someone else or in helping yourself working through grief. So that's what I wanted to share with you. 
and I will pass it back to Amy. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that he has been somewhat helpful to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Alex, for that great presentation. We will now go into the question and answer portion of our webinar. Um, so I'll, I'll pause for just a moment to allow people to type their questions. And as a reminder, if you have a question related to this topic, you can just type it into the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and while we, while people are typing their questions, I did want to address one question that we got um, a little earlier, wondering, um, a participant wondering if these chaplain seminars will be added to the spiritual care channel. Um, they say that these are very well done, and they also say, Chaplain Alex, I am so proud of you. So I wanted to share that. Um, these, these webinars are... Um, currently, they are not posted to the Spiritual Care Channel, and I'm assuming um, that this person is referring to the Mayo Clinic Spiritual Care Channel, um, but that is a great idea and something I can certainly look into. We do have it. These are posted on um, the Mayo Clinic Cancer YouTube page, as well as the video library that I referred to in my introduction on our Mayo Clinic Cancer Center education blog. So it's posted in a couple of different areas, but thank you for that suggestion. That's something I'll certainly look into and see if that's something that we can do. And the other thing I wanted to address is that um, Alex, one of your slides mentioned online support groups potentially at the Cancer Center. So I did want to let people know that, um, that support groups are out there and open and available for, for you to get support. The, the best suggestion I have to get connected to a support group is, well, there's a couple different ways. So you could go out to Mayo Clinic Connect, which is where our cancer education blog is or our page is, but it's also a much bigger platform that has a variety of different online discussion groups or support groups available. So you can just go to the support groups tab on Mail Clinic Connect, and you can search for groups there and get connected that way. I would recommend searching for if there's a specific cancer type that you want to get connected with other people with a similar diagnosis or experience. You could type in that cancer type and see if there's a group that comes up that feels like a good fit for you. There are also loss and grief support groups available on Connect as well. If you're looking for something that maybe isn't kind of that online discussion format, uh, you could also contact one of our patient navigators here at our Cancer Education Center, and they um, can try to get you connected with a, with a support group, either virtually, a lot of them are being done virtually over Zoom right now, or in person, um, if that option is available as well. So to get a hold of a patient navigator, you can go right out to our cancer education blog um, page on Mail Clinic Connect, and then you just click on the patient navigator tab, and uh, there the number and the email to get a hold of them is on there. So just a couple of suggestions if that's something that you're looking for or interested in. All right, so let's move on to some questions here. This person is wondering, are there any specific resources that you recommend on this topic, like books or articles or websites specifically? I have done some research. I read some articles. Um, there's one that I cannot remember specifically the title of the other article, but if I were to recommend a resource outside of book or a research that I have done myself, I would say process out loud, get a place to process your grief or encourage someone to process their grief out loud. 
sadly for the, the resources like a book or things, I, I forgot to put them either at the bottom of my presentation, which I should also, I apologize for that, but um, I could, I don't know Amy, how I can work it out, you know, try to put those articles there. So if people want to go a little bit deeper on those um, reading, they can. So I will either explore ways of putting in this either presentation or somewhere online um, the articles that I have found very helpful. There is quite a few books um, about grief and loss. And again, I do not have it with me. So I do apologize. I don't have a specific one with me, but um, there are plenty that you could and would find out there. So I don't have a specific one per se. All right, thank you. Yes, we can talk about how that might be possible, I'm trying to brainstorm and rack my brain right now. But um, yeah. so yeah, we can see how we can get that information out. I would say if it's, um, if there is, a person specifically looking for resources, maybe the best way is to reach out to the Cancer Education Center. You'll see our email in on the Cancer Education page. Um, so that might be what I recommend. If you're specifically looking for resources, you can inquire by sending an email to us, and then I will reach out to Alex and try to um, get you connected or get those resources to you. I think that might be the best way to go about it. Perfect. All right. We have another comment coming through. Chaplain Alex has a wonderful speaking voice, which is very soothing. I truly enjoyed listening to him. Thank you. So I wanted to share that feedback. Thank you so much. Let's see, can you provide any guidance on how to talk to children about grief and loss related to cancer? That's a very good question. Um, obviously, children process grief different than adults. What I have personally found helpful is to understand or try to understand how children understand what they're going through. So I'm gonna to try to rephrase that. Let's say a, a child was uh, diagnosed with cancer and they don't quite fully understand what really what's really happening to them. It's just to under it's to ask them questions in trying to figure out what they are understanding of what they're going through right now. What's what's what do you think is happening? It is also with children and i'm talking about little children games and play you will find children playing and processing their grief they would play a role and they will tell you how they feel and that i have found very powerful it's just to be able to sit with a child or even if a child is on a hospital bed, but just trying to bring that play mode and that person, children, special, especially, I'm not, I'm not a um, specialist with, um, you know, kids, but the little that I have done with little ones, it's in the play, in the fun, they find it easy to open up and process their grief. So make it playful, um, make it a playful setting and you will hear them talk because they do play roles they you know they you would hear a child playing you know doing something like okay i'm the mommy i'm doing this or i'm the child i'm doing this but as they play those roles their feelings come out and they 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 play those role through their toys and you will hear them oh it's okay you know i i know i'm gonna be okay and that's how they process but that's how they grieve so play is, is one that I have found personally very helpful, and that's probably the, the only one that I have right now. And as you go to children a little bit older, they just need to feel like they're safe. Unless you are their parents, they may not open up, but if you, may, if you make that area very safe, safe enough, where that sometimes you will see their parents in the room as well, 
but they would look at their parents a lot just to make sure, hey, is this safe for me to talk? Is it safe for me to say what I want to say or what I'm asked to say? They will look and they will look back at you. So you have that interaction that children do because they look up to their parents and they want to make sure that they're safe and they're okay. And, you know, parents would oftentimes say, no, go ahead, it's okay, you can talk, you can open up, I'm here. And I just reassure them to step into the, the, the process, the grief, the process of grief. So those are the only two things I have. Sadly, I, I wish I had more. But when it comes to kids, I'm not uh, the specialist, but I have done some, and that's what I can offer. Those are great suggestions. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A, so we will go ahead and close out this session. I would like to thank everyone for participating today. You can click on the link that I shared in the chat to learn more about upcoming classes and webinars that we're offering, and also to view this recording once it's posted in our video library. Okay. When this webinar has ended, you will be prompted to take a quick survey. We really appreciate your willingness to fill out this survey as your feedback is very helpful to ensure that we are offering educational opportunities that are going to be valuable to you. So with that, I will say thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you to all of you.